So, welcome everyone to our fifth session, Investing in Retail Business. So in this session, uh, we will have two speakers who will discuss the fundamentals and economics of a coffee retail business from an investor's perspective. Our first speaker is Burak Kalici, CEO of Quitum. Burak has been in the finance sector for more than two decades. More, more recently at Morgan Stanley, where he spent 12 years in the investment management division. He had the pleasure to take part in the growth of specialty coffee industry with investments ranging from founder-led early stage roasters to large publicly traded leaders in the space. Borak is also serving on the SEA board as our treasurer. So please welcome Borak. Thank you, Anis. Uh... Hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, so as Yanis said, my background uh, is in finance. Uh, it's in the dark side, if you will. Uh, I recently launched my own investing firm uh, with my team uh, to be a partner and shareholder to great businesses and, and great entrepreneurs. Um, and as uh, Yanis said, I have brought experience investing in restaurants and coffee companies uh, around the world. Actually, currently, we're uh, partners in two founder-led wonderful um, multi-channel coffee businesses, one in California and the other one in Italy. I currently live in Texas with my family uh, and honored to be involved with the SCA as your fellow board member and treasurer. So without ado, further ado, let's jump in. So why coffee? So as an investor, I've always written a thesis write-up that lays out the reasons for the underlying investment um, uh, before we, we pull the trigger. And, and interestingly, the main reasons for my interest in coffee uh, over the, the last decade or so has been incredibly consistent. What was too, true uh, 10 years ago is, is still true today. And these are the same reasons uh, I wrote down uh, for years uh, before uh, every coffee investment. So what are they? Number one, uh, coffee is habit forming. Uh, it's healthy, it's, it's, it's legal, um, and, and uh, this kind of uh, characteristics implies strong pricing power. Coffee is highly emotional from many different angles. Uh, this evokes a strong preference uh, for the consumer, creating a, a potentially steep premiumization curve. Um, and, and this is unlike other categories that are habit forming, such as toothpaste, which is also habit forming, but uh, I don't know many people that are uh, as passionate about their, their toothpaste. And coffee is ubiquitous. Uh, the, the world already consumes it. The, the industry does not need to overspend to create primary demand um, uh, compared to other categories such as energy drinks. Last but not least, uh, people tend to consume coffee more frequently early in the day. And this is important because breakfast and morning patterns are less prone to change once established. It's just how hum humans behave. And this leads to loyalty and repetitive business, um, uh, which is very valuable from a commercial stand standpoint. So beyond these uh, characteristics, I wanna step back and kind of talk about uh, the basics of how a retail restaurant works. And, and some of the concepts I'm going to talk about here might seem very rudimentary, but I think there's a difference between understanding a simple concept and actually using it as a framework. And, and since majority of our audience is uh, independent uh, retailers and baristas, I would urge them to think about how this framework uh, applies uh, to them and their business. So, in its most basic sense, uh, if you do look uh, at uh, uh, retail uh, restaurant investment, the first item that you need to consider is simply how much cash is coming out of your pocket to get the business up and running, which is the takeoff stage. And this is a balance sheet item. Uh, this is uh, the capital expenditures, the pre-opening costs, uh, could be marketing, other soft items you might have to spend money on. Uh, reduced by tenant incentive uh, uh, allowances, uh, sometimes the landlord reduces your capex. Uh, uh, added by, in some countries, we do have key money where you need to pay the prior tenant uh, to get out and inventory. So you have a total cash investment amount. And the second relevant item is your operating model. And the, the, these are kind of the metrics you need to tune uh, at, at cruising altitude. 
And as you can see, this classification here differs from traditional accounting, uh, but most in the industry believe that this is more intuitive for operating purposes. So the reason this is more helpful than traditional accounting is that uh, you know, you're focused on the major expense budget buckets. So you keep your eyes on what's controllable and the profit is kind of your residual, right? So you have food costs, which for a, a, a very good retailer should typically run, should run below uh, 30% as a, as a portion of revenues. Labor costs in the US, again, 30% is a good ratio to think about. Um, it could be higher in areas with uh, more heavy, heavy uh, labor laws, such as uh, Europe, uh, Italy is an example. Occupancy cost uh, should uh, not exceed into double digits if possible. I've seen situations that are as high as 20%, but uh, unless it's an isolated circumstance, it's very hard to um, be economically viable at, at high levels. So if you add all of these um, expenses, uh, you kind of uh, get to a four wall store level margin. And the simple uh, calculation of a cash on cash return is the, the, the four wall margin divided by your total cash investment and here again, I'll, I'll throw a benchmark. If this is above 30%, you're probably in a, in a very uh, attractive category, which means you have a 3.3 year uh, payback uh, on your investment in cash terms. So let's um, keep that in our pocket and let's talk about scaling. So every retailer wants to grow, uh, but what does it take to grow and why do we want to grow? So uh, that four wall metric uh, that we described applies to a unit level profit. And if you're an owner run business that, and you don't intend to grow um, uh, your business, you know, uh, what I'm gonna talk about is less relevant. But if you're a retailer that wants to grow, this is very relevant. So we have the four wall margin and then uh, a retailer that wants to grow has to have um, uh, a central cost layer, right? You need to have an administrative office you need to have people behind desktops uh, rather than a bar. Uh, so people behind phones and, and, and computers rather than behind a bar or coffee machine. So uh, in this example, again, if you had a, let's say 40% cash on cash return in your model, um, you would have uh, some extra costs and, and you could probably uh, open a store every three years. Now, if you, if you intend to grow and uh, you open more units, uh, this is where the operating leverage comes in, right? As you open more units, you get you get more uh, sharing of your central overhead. The number of people behind the desktops does not need to grow at the same pace. So you split that cost across more units. So the higher the, the total amount of profit that you capture, the lesser the dilutive effect of the overhead. And the more cash available for you to deploy and the faster your growth rate, right? So 40% cash on cash return, uh, with even with the overhead, if you open a store every three years, that also implies if you have three stores, you, put, you can open a new store organically every year off of that base. Now, this math uh, is, is very, very critical because this goes into the, the flywheel of the compounding of your retailer. Um, and, and as an entrepreneur, actually, uh, you, might, you may want to wait until you develop your organic growth engine. Um, and the secret here is that um, when the cash on cash returns are high, you have a successful concept. The alternative cost to taking external financing is also very high, right? High cash on cash returns are the friend of an owner and your major, they become your major deterrent. So why not to take external capital? And as an entrepreneur, uh, I would advise you not to rely on external capital if you do have a model that works well, right? I mean, I'd only take capital from a partner that will bring uh, value to your enterprise. And this simple cash on cash flywheel and the related compounding uh, is why a company like Starbucks started out its journey uh, with less than 20 stores in 1987, and they grew to over 20,000 currently. And if you kind of look at their early metrics, you can tell that their cash on cash returns were way over 40% in the early days, and they're just replowing it uh, into the model that worked. Of course, growth, uh, it's easy to talk about growth, uh, but having a framework of scale and scaling a framework are completely uh, different challenges. So scaling a hospitality business is all about culture. It's all about culture and it's not about capital. If 
Finding the right people with the right determination, the right skill set, and the right loyalty, uh, as we all know, uh, is extremely tough. I mean, you need to create a culture of growth, a positive culture where, where employees can start at a certain role and personally grow into taking more responsibility organically. Growth is an exciting thing. Uh, people want to be inspired. People want to rally behind ambition. And it goes hand in hand. Uh, you know, growth will attract the right people. But the glue here is culture. You need to create a fair workplace where the people want to stay, where people enjoy serving their customers one cup at a time. Without this, the growth uh, uh, equation is not going to work. And then, of course, there is the brand. And I referred to, uh, in the earlier slides, economics of restaurants or cafes, retail businesses. But I believe this is a major understatement for the potential of coffee businesses. And here's why. If, if you do create a, a loyalty around your retail location and you build a brand that's based on, on that, that positive experience, you earn the right to easily expand your operation. And, and this is very different than a burger or pizza business, right? Coffee businesses can significantly expand their reach beyond a retail location. You can simply bring your product to where the customer is, right? And this is very, very powerful. So if, if, if you do have a successful group of coffee stores, you've most likely built a loyal following. And that loyal following will give you the credibility to expand beyond that physical box. So you venture into the category of becoming a brand rather than a cafe, right? And this is very powerful. It's a deserved status. It's a very valuable status. And this deserved status sort of gives you the right to expand your reach into other channels. And being multi-channel does not start with, uh, you know, saying, hey, we want to become multi-channel. It starts with the brand. So if you do build a brand and a product offering behind that, you can broaden your reach in, in different channels, um, targeting uh, different types of customers in different types of places. You can, you, can, you can broaden your reach dramatically. And what you essentially uh, did is uh, you built more scale beyond that initial operation. Now, now you have more revenue lines. You have your retail segment. You have your product segment. And, and that same overhead, central overhead, the people behind the desks, you can increase them. But you've, you've increased your scale so, so, so much more dramatically that that overhead, again, uh, gets spread out over more, more revenue. And, and the flywheel keeps turning, right? And coffee, in this sense, is unique. Uh, very few restaurant categories will allow you to do that. And expansion opportunities um, uh, do not stop at growth potential uh, for the, the retail stores. So um, an important thing to remember here is that uh, from day one, uh, you should think about your brand. You should nurture it, you should build it consciously, and you should be active with your customers. You should have a consistent message and, and imaging, uh, especially in social media, where, where these days a lot of people uh, kind of set their brand uh, notions. And of course, in the digital world, as many of you might know, we typically track different metrics as a proxy for unit economics. Um, and customer lifetime value here uh, that, that we refer to is the cumulative discounted contribution margin from a customer and upfront expected value of that customer, if you will. And customer acquisition cost is the sales and marketing costs you incur to gain that customer. And in a way, this is the digital equivalent of, of that cash on cash ratio that we discussed. The reason we measure this at the customer or sometimes at the cohort level uh, in the digital world is simply because we have um, detailed data, right? Most physical retailers do not have uh, customer level information, uh, of course, at, at their own detriment, right? And technology leaders such as Sephora or Starbucks um, that have linked physical stores with customer information are able to run analysis of this sort, even in physical retail locations. So this metric can be applied to any kind of recurring service um, or, or, or product. And again, as a, as a rule of thumb, a ratio of anything higher than three is usually considered to be high. A very important point, uh, pricing. It's an incredible opportunity for our industry. I mean, when we first started looking at coffee, uh, specialty coffee 10 years ago, a basic espresso um, shot in the US was around $2, $2.25. 
And today it's easily a dollar higher if, if it's not a single origin. Um, but I'd like to uh, emphasize that, that pricing is not something you take. You need to deserve that privilege. You need to deliver a product and service that deserves that. So how do you do that? The first is through innovation. And here's an example. Uh, this is this uh, beautiful photo is a cup of cafe misu. This was prepared by our partner, uh, Francesco Sanapo from uh, Dita Artigianale in Florence um, during their visiting roaster month at La Marzocco Cafe in Seattle in, in 2019. And interestingly, uh, apart from all the wonderful uh, drinks they brought and, and a, a lot of selection of coffees they had, this was their highest selling item during that month at a whopping price of $5.50. I mean, it's something people had not seen before and they responded to that with their choices, right? And, and in our industry, we have very talented baristas behind every bar and I'd encourage cafes to experiment more. Customers will appreciate that innovation. It matters a lot. The other opportunity in pricing, in my opinion, is through education, right? I mean, our industry is sitting uh, on a tremendous opportunity, I think, to, to educate their customers. Take the wine in industry, for instance, right? So if you went to a store, you wanted to buy Italian wine, you know, fine, it's $10 a bottle. And then you say, okay, well, I want to buy a, a bottle of red wine from Tuscany. Okay, $15 a bottle. If you want to buy a, a wine from the Montalcino region, uh, uh, it's going to be higher. If it's a Brunello di Montalcino designated uh, uh, wine, it's going to be at least $30 a bottle. But if you come in and, and somebody says, okay, it's a Brunello di Montalcino from Poggio di Sotto, okay, you, you pay $100 a bottle, right? And then you go in and if it's a bottle of Brunello di Montalcino from, from Poggio di Sotto 2004, it's even more than that. Right. There's a very steep premiumization curve. Um, and as I mentioned, coffee is an emotional category. We do have an incredible opportunity uh, to educate our customers. And, and this is also critical, not from a commercial stand, standpoint, but educating our customers will trickle down the value chain. Everybody in the value chain all the way to the farms would benefit from this. So uh, please educate your customers. It benefits everybody. An unpleasant topic. I'm not going to say uh, much on this. Um, I think uh, my friend Will will expand on this. Uh, but three things uh, in, in summary that I want to iterate. Um, uh, in a few quarters, travel and traffic will start. Uh, humans will come to normal, uh, more normal patterns. Uh, this is this is temporary, as painful as it is right now. It is temporary. Um, the second thing I'll say is uh, habits that are formed during the pandemic uh, might be here to stay. It takes five weeks for a habit to, to really uh, cement, and, and we might be keeping some of our hab habits. It might uh, be relevant for your business inside a shop or, or the way consumers interact with a brand. And the third thing I want to mention is that uh, we should expect um, you know, more shutdowns and more volatility to come. Uh, over the next few years, it should not come in as a surprise for your business. It's it be, be, better be well prepared than surprise. Uh, but this is not just going to go away uh, with a vaccine right away. It's going to be a volatile operating environment for the next few years. We should be prepared. With that, my uh, contact info is here. Please feel free to, to email me or, or send me uh, a message. Uh, we're here. Uh, to answer anything uh, that, that you might have in your mind. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A session after this. But with that, I'll leave it uh, to my friend, Will. Thank you so much, Burak. Um, I, I would like to say, um, before we go to questions, we're going to bring our second speaker, Will Slabo. Uh, Will is the Chief Investment Officer at Dobbs Brothers Management. Dobbs Brothers Management large, largest interest currently include like 50 Wendy's restaurant, 11 Slim Chicken restaurants, and three Anheuser Boost distributorships. Prior to joining DBM in 2020, Will was with Stevens Incorporation uh, for 13 years. In addition to his role as Associate Director of Equity Research, 
Will was the senior restaurant analyst for nine years, where he provided research coverage for over 30 publicly traded restaurant companies to institutional investors. Prior to that, Will worked in firm's corporate finance decision, uh, division, and it's a pleasure to have you with us, Will. So the stage is yours. Thank you, Giannis. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for, for having me, and, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, and it's an honor to, to follow uh, my friend Barack. Uh, so, so I'll get started here, and, and, and um, similar to Barack, I'll keep this fairly high level and um, look forward to answering any questions that you may have um, after we're finished. So, uh, so as, as Giannis mentioned, my background is uh, it, it, it began in, the, um, in corporate finance and then I moved fairly quickly into the public markets. So a lot of my background for, um, for over a decade was in the public markets following primarily restaurant companies uh, and, and the larger coffee chains were in that as well. So, um, so I dealt with a lot of the, the publicly traded businesses. My current role is, um, is both overseeing our current investments and Giannis mentioned um, we're one of the largest franchisees in the Wendy system. Uh, we are the largest franchisee in the Slim Chicken system. Um, we're always actively looking to both invest further in those systems because we believe in those and also to find the next great brand to add to our portfolio because we feel like we have a great um, a great back office and great team uh, and great leadership. And that that's similar to what what Barack talked about a minute ago. And, um, you know, once you have that great G&A structure, which we feel like we do have here at DBM, we can add on another brand and really stretch out our GNA because we feel like we have that great human capital to do so. Um, so um, with that, I'll, I'll launch into um, to, to sort of the, the coffee landscape as I see it um, from the lens of, of many investors. And the reason that I put many investors is you can think about it this way, at least in my opinion, that the, the majority of investors that you're going to deal with, um, they invest across the many industries. We tend to see things fairly simply and often from a very high level. So while this can often make us guilty of not gaining a full appreciation of a particular business's finer points, it also keeps us out of trouble. Um, and by that, I mean keeping us from one, competing against an industry behemoth that we don't have to, um, or two, fighting against an emerging or a clear industry trend. Um, so that's, that's sort of a, you know, the top down way that most investors are gonna look at things. So it will come to no surprise to you at all that amount of experience investors, both public and private, uh, see the retail coffee world as Starbucks versus nearly everyone else. Um, there are many exceptions to this, but I think that's the first question that most are going to ask as they think about the retail world in, in coffee. Uh, Duncan does extremely uh, well in the Northeast. They've made some nice inroads um, in, in many other states. I believe they're focused right now on 15 other states in terms of, of penetration. Um, there are obviously many other smaller chains and local coffee shops that have com competed successfully against Starbucks, but understanding your positioning versus the industry leader and not just globally and, and in the country, but also in your region is, is extraordinarily important. Um, here are a few quick stats to help make this point um, and just why I think a lot of guys are going to are going to focus here um, when, when you start talking about positioning. Um, when we think about Starbucks and, and Dunkin'. Um, and again, I'm, I, I probably know too much about these uh, larger brands, given that's been a lot of my life over the past uh, decade and change. Starbucks holds about a 40 percent market share of U.S. coffee shops, uh, which is an enormous number. That's you think about McDonald's is in the 30s. Um, uh, sorry, not quite in the 30s. And, and most other um, most other leaders in their industry are below that. So 40 percent is extraordinary and, and a higher market share of the dollars because their average unit volumes of their stores are higher. And my guess is it's probably going to be closer to 50 percent once it shakes out from last year. So nearly half the dollars spent in the industry um, are going to one player. So that's extraordinary. We need to know how we, we compete against that. Um, the second stat I would tell you is that pre-COVID, Starbucks and Duncan combined to account for 80 percent of new coffee shop openings in the U.S., four out of five, which is another extraordinary figure. So market share continuing to go their way after nearly. Again, just one of the players owns owns half of it. Um, so I found those two stats um, pretty interesting. Um, so as we think about sort of let, let's continue that and say, OK, we know all these things. How is the landscape changing because of last year or is it changing? I, I believe that it is. And I believe strongly that it is. Um, so we know the consumer is changing in, in what he or she values. Those changes, in my opinion, were only sped up with COVID's impact during 2020. Um, I, I've broken these down into a few things. The first thing I tell you is 
the coffee consumer has always cared about convenience. Convenience has been a big deal. Barack mentioned that if you're if you're early in the uh, in the in the morning, if you're part of that morning day part, it is more habitual. Um, the morning day part has been the fastest growing day part within uh, quick service for many years, um, and that's because once you form that habit, it's extraordinarily hard to break. Um, and and whereas with lunch and dinner, you typically um, choose different options day to day. So that convenience has always been very important. Now the consumer cares even more, especially if this increased convenience includes drive-throughs and technology. Um, technology is table stakes, but it's also a convenience. Uh, just look at the success of drive-through only brands in the past few years, including um, you know, in my home state, Seven Brew. Um, Dutch Brothers has been very successful. That convenience has really, um, again, become table stakes here, I think, I think in the industry. The second thing is over the past two decades, the consumer uh, has learned to appreciate an increasingly demand quality. Um, Barack mentioned the pricing power that the industry has, um, and, and he quoted some espresso pricing figures. There's so much innovation happening in coffee now where that, that wasn't even dreamed of five years ago, much less 10 years ago. Um, the coffee consumer cares about this now, and, and quality doesn't just mean Arabica beans. It means the best cold brew, nitro, espresso-based beverages, teas, also brewed coffee in town. So you've got to be able to compete at, at all levels. The third thing is the coffee consumer cares much more about sustainability than the typical U.S. consumer, and this is only increasing. So why is that? He or she is typically younger. Um, he or she is typically more highly educated. He or she uh, is more engaged in world affairs. Um, Ten years ago, we had no idea where the coffee we consume was grown. Today, we can trace it to the farmer. Um, we actually had a call with one of the largest distributors uh, in the world last week, and they talked about how they're already doing this today. And pretty soon, with every bag of coffee that you buy in the grocery store, not to mention a cup of coffee you get from a retailer, you will be able to tell which farmer grew that bean. Um, and, and the consumer cares about that. And not just because they want to feel good, but also it, it's uh, um, from for health purposes. We saw the traceability being an important uh, issue for Chipotle a few years back. Um, it's, it's just it's becoming important for many, many reasons. The fourth thing I've got here is that the coffee consumer wants coffee and tea based beverages throughout the day. With very few exceptions, the days of thriving as a morning coffee stop are over. And that's a good thing. Um, this is going to separate um, sort of your traditional coffee house from what I believe is going to be the coffee shop of the future. And that is we can sell you something that you want throughout the day. Um, it, it's going to be heavier in the morning. That's just that's just um, the way life is right now. However, um, people want nitro cold brews in the afternoon. Uh, people want something that's going to be a little bit different, maybe after work on the way home. Uh, that wasn't the case five years ago, 10 years ago. It is, it is increasingly the case. And that's going to help you leverage your rent, leverage your operating costs uh, in general um, a lot better. So we think that's important and, and making it making the space, by the way, a lot more interesting to investors um, as you can sort of spread those those sales out and not have to really be extraordinary in one day for it. So it's a bit of a diversification play as, as investors might think about. It. Um, so so the, the, the last slide I have on here and again, I'll try to uh, keep this short and sweet. As we think about criteria for private investment, and this is something that we're doing every single day, um, we talk a lot about numbers and I'll be happy to, to go into more detail there if you care to. Um, but the first and most important thing is the positioning of the brand. Um, what I mean by that is, how do you stack up against the top national, regional, local competitor? This is gonna include product quality, pricing, brand perception. Um, and I'll, I'll talk just one second about pricing. Brock had a, a section on that, which I, I totally agree with. It's it, it would have been shocking, I think, in years back to think about a, a, a run of the mill um, coffee based beverage being five dollars and fifty cents. Today, that's that's sort of a natural thing for a lot of people and, and especially younger consumers to spend on a coffee based beverage, um, whether it's your extract or, or just a, a latte type beverage. Um, this is something that I think. Um, is is important to see that the consumer is willing to spend it, but also that you have to really provide that quality to earn that dollar. Um, if you charge someone five fifty and it doesn't meet up to their standards, they're not going to come back. However, they are happy to spend it if it's unique and if the quality is high. So I think I think all that is is extraordinarily important, um, but also very good signs that we're seeing. So um, 
you know, the, the last thing I mentioned on positioning is how do you compete? Uh, what is your what is your niche? Um, being a Me Too player is very difficult these days, especially when you have large competitors that can sort of play in every category. So what I'd say is, you know, how you compete against that local player, how you compete against that national player is, is very important. So that that positioning is the first thing that we look at and the first box that we have to check. Um, Unit economics, you've, you've already heard a little bit about, so I won't spend too much time there. But, um, you know, store level margins, and, and Barack mentioned 30 percent is a great number. I, I, I totally agree with that. Um, I would tell you that, that you know, Starbucks is even below that. Uh, so m many are, are below it, but but 30 is what we try to shoot for. Um, because what what typically happens is if you have a brand that wants to expand, you're probably starting off with with a handful of stores and your handful of stores in your home market are typically going to be very, very good. So we like to see you really putting up extraordinary numbers in your in your home market um, so that when we start to prove out portability in some markets that don't know who who you are in terms of a brand, we feel like we have a little bit of a buffer. So so that's why we like to see really good numbers so that when we fall back and, and, and get a, a larger base of stores that we can settle into at least 20 percent, 25 percent on average, because, again, that 30 percent is really what we're shooting for. Um, in terms of day part mix, and I touched on this a little bit, I give this its own category in the coffee segment, given how important it is for your brand to prove it can thrive beyond the breakfast day part. Do you have a legitimate lunch or afternoon business? Is there enough evening business to warrant keeping your doors open? Uh, again, considering coffee's traditionally limited day part exposure, low average check, checking this box is critical. Um, even though percent margins are typically high in, in the coffee space, we need to be able to, to spread out that traffic throughout the day and build traffic throughout the day. So where, where I typically wouldn't put that in terms of criteria for investment in the coffee space, we need to be able to see that. Um, the fourth thing is portability. Many new brands perform well in their home markets, whether they're at A plus real estate locations or, or off the beaten path. How well do you do in newer markets with no brand presence? Um, we're we're going to want to see that before we put any, any dollars to work. How consistent are your volumes in similar quality sites? So if I'm at Main and Main Street in Oklahoma City and I'm at Main and Main Street in Kansas City, how do those stores look in terms of volumes and in terms of margins? Um, so, so those things are, are, are extraordinarily important too. And then the last thing I put on here is, is convenience and technology. Technology is, is table stakes. You know, I, how good is your app? Um, I, I think that's, that's something that, that we're going to ask today that we wouldn't have asked a few years ago. And, 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 you know, last year, again, just sped that up. What is your mobile mix? Uh, because that customer is going to spend on average, some will tell you 15% more, some will tell you 30% more, but they're going to spend a lot more. And as we all know, that single customer spending more money, that, that flow to the bottom line at a much higher percent margin. So, so we, want, we want that mobile mix to be as high as possible. We want to plan for it to go even higher. Uh, what percentage of your business is drive through a curbside? Again, that, we want that, that to be a high number because that uses a little bit less labor. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and, and again, um, that convenience angle uh, and the importance of convenience is something that we saw last year um, in terms of how crucial uh, all that is. So, so that's th those are most of the points I wanted to make in terms of, of our thought process in terms of thinking of the next the next great investment that we want to put in our portfolio, and that could be either through an investment um, in the business itself or to be um, your your largest franchisee. Um, so that's kind of how we think about both of those things because whether I'm a franchisee or whether I own part of the business. I, th I have to think about this as an owner because if, if, if the business doesn't perform well for its owners, it's not going to perform well for anyone. Uh, and so that's why we think about these these things uh, in, the, in the same light. Um, so, so in closing, I, I would just sort of sum up and say coffee is a rapidly changing category. And I think faster than anything else within retail food uh, or beverage. Outside of a few large brands, it's traditionally taken very strong and active management to make a traditional coffee shop work from an economic standpoint, especially if you want to enjoy profitable expansion. But today, I think you know we're starting to, to see brands take advantage of shifts in customer demands and successfully compete. So that's what's so interesting to us about it. Um, this is helped you know, by technology costs coming down. Uh, and and I, I'm a true believer in technology leveling the playing field over time. I think this is already happening. I think it's going to continue to happen. 
Um, so, so that's, that's a big reason I think why we're going to see not only, you know, today, um, the companies like Dutch brothers move up from a convenience and technology standpoint and really take advantage of market share to be had. But over time, a lot of these, uh, newer brands can, can really level the playing field with, with technology. Um, and then last thing I'd say is, well, I think Starbucks and Dunkin' are in great positions to continue their expansion across the U.S. I also believe we will see many more coffee brands emerge in the drive through only format and traditional format as consumer demands have now quickly changed in recent years. And, and what consumers really care about is, is shifting along with those. So um, so that's what I had prepared. And, and I guess from there, I'll, I'll flip it back over to Giannis and we can uh, we can take questions. Thank you so much, Will. Um... I think Burak is going to join us. I want to thank you actually both for, for taking the time. Um, um, you shared some very interesting insights. And I would like to to start coming into the questions that we have been getting from, from the audience. But I would like to start with one thing. Like over the last year during the pandemic, we've seen a lot of things happening when it comes to curbside pickup, takeout, delivery. And we've seen like companies... Uh, growing like Dorda, Subarit, uh, and they are taking a significant margin out of the the retailers, the, the retailers, the coffee shops. So, how do you see that, and how long are they here to stay for? Like, what do you think it's going to be like the the economics of a shop looking like after the pandemic, and how big takeaway will remain in in, in as a percentage of revenue? I'll start with whoever you want, Burak, Will. Burak, I think you're muted. Sure, I'll, I'll start there. Um, so I, I think that delivery um, is very difficult in the coffee segment, um, just operationally speaking, and I'm sure all of you know that even better than I do. When you deal with a, a very hot or a very cold beverage, you're talking about um, really placing the quality of your product in the hands of someone who doesn't have a vested interest in the quality of that product being as high as you do. So that's just, that's extraordinarily difficult. The consumer wants convenience. So I, I consider delivery part of this whole convenience ecosystem that you mentioned a minute ago. So whether that's drive through whether that's mobile, um, whether that's curbside, um, I think you need to be really good at what you can do really well. And to me in the coffee space, that's going to be drive through that's going to be curbside. That's going to be having the best mobile experience that you can possibly have. Um, I'm not a big believer in delivery outside of batch, dense urban delivery. Um, if you're spread out further than that, I think it's going to be very difficult. Um, but I'd, I'd, I'd pass it off to Barack if he has a different view. Um, uh, Will, I, I, I think we, we share a similar view in this. Uh, I mean, delivery in general, once you've convinced someone uh, to, to sit on their couch instead of going to a restaurant and ordering food uh, and, and the whole uh, ecosystem and, and labor involved in bringing that food to them is highly inefficient, right? I mean, there's a reason the restaurant model worked uh, in the first place. It is a highly efficient model. Uh, so as, as Will said, unless there are certain circumstances such, such as density and the size of the order, the economics of delivery uh, does not work in my opinion uh, for for majority of cases and there's another dynamic in the US uh, you know we, we have um, one of the highest uh, car ownership ratios it's over 800, 800 uh, cars per capita and uh, any 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 kind of chain restaurant in the US at scale has a, has a very meaningful um, revenue derived from drive-through and as will said I, I'm a big believer in, in probably ordering ahead and takeout uh, enabling that that uh, that uh, convenience, uh, and not only not only on the back end but on the front end as well. You know, because when when you've engaged a customer on a, on a takeout um, transaction, you've also captured their data, right? You've also engaged in a different kind of relationship that you can replicate. Uh, and and we've seen different models around the world uh, where they've taken that loyalty and repetitive uh, business and, and turned it into successful ventures. But I, I think. Uh, takeout uh, or pickup is going to be a meaningful part for the industry, but delivery in general, I think the economics are, are uh, questionable, in my opinion. 
So Burak, take out or uh, pick, take out or curbside. But the question here that I have for you is through like applications that the coffee shops develop by them, themselves or going through a bigger network. And at the end of the day, who owns the, the customer data? Um, that's, a, that's a good question here. Well, you're, you're touching uh, another very uh, important element here. Uh, who owns the customer data? And, and the restaurant industry started asking this question uh, a few years ago uh, to avoid kind of the, the destiny of the travel industry, right? Where uh, uh, the hotel industry at some point lost the connection to its customers, to third party uh, intermediaries. And, and this is kind of happening uh, in, in the restaurant space as well. So uh, if, if you do have intermediaries that control the flow, the traffic, um, the pricing power they're going to exert on that traffic, uh, it's, a form of, uh, uh, it's, it's a form of a rent, right? I mean, you're paying for traffic. It becomes beyond a service fee. It becomes a form of rent that uh, where the landlord can increase it based on demand by just clicking a button, right? So it is extremely important to your point that uh, brands, retailers, cafes uh, do take the initiative to build brand relationships or, or digital capabilities where they have a direct access to the customer without relying on third party platforms. So um, I think we're going to come back to this as I see the questions coming in, but I would like to, to go a bit on the investment side. So, Will, going to you, have you seen a coffee investment uh, recently that caused you to raise your eyebrows? Like um, that came uh, either came out of nowhere or you felt that the value was uh, overstated? Um, I've seen a, a handful that really caused me to raise my eyebrows lately um, and, and in a good way. So um, without without getting into to too much detail, um, what's been floated around lately is, is, is a couple of different things. One is the drive through only concept, which I mentioned a minute ago. Um, and, and we've seen some really eye popping numbers there. Uh, and, and you want to be careful as an investor not to say, not to just dive, you know, uh, head first in and, and, and assume that that 2020 is going to continue forever, because as we know, certain things, certain parts of it will and certain parts of it won't. But What's what's really beautiful about that concept when it works well is it's a low cost to build. So I can get in for four hundred thousand dollars, three hundred fifty thousand dollars, six hundred thousand dollars, whatever the number is, but a, a lower than average build out. I've got less labor. I've got a slightly smaller store to keep up. Some operating costs are just simply lower. My fixed costs are lower. The volumes that we've seen from some of these stores that do it right. Uh, and, and do what I can refer to as the Chick-fil-A model of getting out and, and taking orders and really driving throughput. And again, throughput, that goes that works back into convenience. So I'd rather spend money on my people taking care of you when you know you can drive through very, very fast, but also get that high quality cup of coffee versus spending money on DoorDash. Um, so if, if you get out and, and you're out in front of the store up with your iPad taking orders, you know, we've seen some really eye popping numbers, both on, on from a revenue perspective and a profit perspective from some of those brands. Um, we've also seen some um, some traditional coffee shops evolve the model a little bit and try to be a little bit more than what they were. And by that, I mean, improving their food offerings, trying to expand a little bit more into lunch um, and uh and, and afternoon um, dinner, I think, is still tough in this space, but lunch and, and afternoon. So and, and that's that's worked well in particular markets. But I think with the latter, you have to be very specific on uh, the type of market that you go into. So. Um, so, yeah, you know, appropriately, those those drive through only uh, concepts that I mentioned a minute ago are um, asking for very high valuations. And again, they've, they've done extraordinarily well. Um, but I think there's going to be room to expand concepts like that across the country. And, and the ones that I mentioned in terms of more, more traditional that are, that are expanding what they do, that tends to be a little bit more in my mind, a market by market basis. Um, and it's difficult to stamp out, you know, we can build X number of these in the country. That's a, that's a, a tougher investment for me to underwrite at scale um, than the drive through only model, which to me is, is what is, has emerged as, hey, this could really be something very interesting. So to build on that, uh, and Burak, I'm going to come to you. You were talking about customer acquisition and the cost of customer acquisition. 
what do we think about subscriptions? I think over the pandemic, we've seen a boom in subscriptions and, and different approaches on the subscription model. Like it's not only your coffee for home, it's like a subscription model for coffees that you're taking throughout the month by visiting the store or, or, or doing takeout. What do you think about that? Because that speaks about customer loyalty and, and a high customer, I would say, retention rate. Sure. The um, well, first of all, the subscription business model is a very powerful one, right? Uh, and and not only because you get repeat business, but also uh, by a simple fact that that you can quantify the value of that relationship uh, to some level of accuracy, and that starts with being able to track the transaction and track the customer. But I. I with with the popularity of that business model, I, I've seen a lot of people also stretch the definition of what's a subscription, right? I mean, traditionally, we've looked at things that have um, a 90% annual retention rate as things subscription worthy, right? 10-year relationships. We're talking about enterprise software. We're talking about elevator maintenance contracts, right? Things that have really long duration um, uh, angles to it, sometimes contractually, sometimes not. Uh, but I, I think more recently in, in the consumer space, especially, I'm, I'm talking more broadly uh, beyond coffee, we've seen a lot of models where, where they take a traditional retail, they put a subscription hat on it, and suddenly um, you're allowed to uh, talk different um, valuation multiples rather than profitability, right? So uh, if, if, if there's inherent... Um, repetitiveness in the model and coffee is actually one category uh, if you have if you have a machine in your in your house uh, if you have a grinder you're 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 a repeating you're a repeating customer you know in that case it makes sense there are some occurrences that it makes a lot of sense but in general uh, you take a good idea and you go extreme it can become a bad idea so in general i, I like that business model but i've seen a lot of people stretch it as well Interesting. Um, so you talk about multiples on the business and I want to ask the question to both of you. So um, I'm seeing a question here that says, what kind of uh, coffee businesses valuate or valuation metrics are you seeing on average, like EBITDA or cash flow multiples? And what is your preferred metric? Yeah, we. Uh, I'd be curious what Barack would say here as well. Um, we, we've seen a few here recently, and and they have been all over the board. I, I would tell you ultimately, um, we like to get down to a cash flow multiple um, because that's that to us is is what matters as as private investors. Um, but everything's gonna gonna sort of start with an EBITDA multiple, um, and, and so I'll, I'll just use that because that's that's a little bit more of a universal metric. Um, we've seen some brands that are that are. Um, call it your, your traditional coffee houses that have three to five stores um, that are gonna trade between five and six and a half times EBITDA, something like that. Um, that three to five can turn into eight to 10. I, I think that, that that's, that's sort of what we've seen. If there is a faster growing um, upstart chain with 10 to 20 units with, with drive-throughs um, and they're doing extraordinarily well we've seen multiples as high as 12 to 15 times even that um, now i'm not telling you those are the right numbers but i'm telling you those are, that's what's being floated around and, and that's where we've seen people raise money um, we've not traditionally been one to, to step out there and say i'm going to pay the most for but but there have been some that, that we've seen pay that um, and and that more highly franchised you are obviously the higher multiple you're going to get because of that people view that as, as subscription revenue if you will so um so so yeah i think it's been all over the map but but yeah, and, and again, this goes back to the whole what changed. It's, it's I think, where we had a world of, of, of haves and have nots somewhat before COVID. Now we have that even more. Um, and so I think those multiple ranges are going to are going to widen even more, too. So in terms of uh, specific metrics, it's hard to really um, uh, characterize something very specifically and I, I, I not saying that because I want to evade the question, but I, I guess it depends on the type of the business, right? So if you're buying a business, like I described, it's a cafe, there's no brand element, um, there's no growth opportunity, then then you're 
your 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 math is around what do you pay for that annual earning stream that doesn't grow, right? And and that 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 you need to take into consideration the amount of risk involved, the amount of risk in the ownership, the the sustainability of that operation, the interest rates, uh, where where the operation is based. Uh, but the more interesting ones that typically we look at are growing businesses, right? And it becomes a more tricky enterprise uh, exercise because uh, in these situations, typically the companies can be loss making, so there might not be a profit multiple. But how do you how do you uh, think about a company that is growing, a company that is starting its organic flywheel? Uh, it hasn't it hasn't started yet. And, and how do you value its earnings power um, a few years out in the future, right? And there's there's many elements to that. I mean, one of them is, um, as we've both indicated, kind of you looking at the unit economics rather than the, the complete picture, kind of dismantling the, the picture on, on what are they achieving on, on the incremental capital that they're deploying? What are the expenses that, that are spending on, on uh, growth uh, or building that platform? Um, and, and the answer is never that clear, but you do need to look out a few years to really understand the potential uh, of, of a unique uh, compounding uh, type entity. And the other thing I'll mention here is uh, there's an intangible of a brand, right? So if you're looking at a, a chain of restaurants uh, that's, that's 10 units that does not have a brand angle, I would look at it very different than a chain of uh, cafes uh, at 10 units that, that does have national or international recognition where you can kind of build those multi-channel uh, other revenue lines beyond that, right? So what do you pay for that? Um, and of course, who's running it, right? I mean, with the right management team, uh, you take that, that uh, model that we described and wonderful things can happen, right? But it's hard to really put a multiple on that. Uh, we, we probably use some sort of owner earnings at a normalized level or future level. Um, but usually it's very different in every case. So to further, um, like we have a question here that will speak into what you just said, Burak, um, in a different kind of angle. There is a question saying, curious, is there a sales mix in the cafe that you would like to see between coffee, food, RTD and other? And I would expand to that, like Will talked about the day part mix there. And you have an asset, you have a, a, you, you're paying a rent and you want to expand the days of the hours that you are actually uh, uh, operating that asset. So the question is like, where do you see that mix? And do you see in the US that in the future we might see a cultural shift or whatever that we have seen in Europe that goes into aperitivo, maybe in Italy, or drinks, beer that we have seen in other parts of, of the world? Maybe I'll, I'll start with that. Um, so, um, you know, that is a very important question uh, because it, it kind of goes to the heart of the operating metrics that I was mentioning. Um, and the ability to attract a higher uh, coffee mix, uh, a higher uh, RTD mix in a box, you know, it's higher margin. Uh, it, it does a lot to your unit economics, right? It doesn't move a lot of volume. Uh, food obviously has higher tickets uh, attached to that. Uh, but, but beverages typically have less complexity, they're higher margin, and they move a lot in the unit economics. So the higher, the better, right? But that doesn't mean if, if you're only 10% food, that doesn't mean you've done a great job in, in beverages, that that probably speaks to uh, your food program not being in place, right? There, there should be a nice balance. Um, and uh, in terms of the, the day part, uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a difficult question. Uh, in, in some countries, culturally, uh, people do wanna hang out uh, at a bar. I mean, the word barista comes from bars, right? And uh, some, some countries culturally, I think, are more open uh, to having uh, people um, uh, have an alcoholic drink at, at later times in the day uh, to come in and, and, and consume a, a beverage. But in general, uh, the volume you need to, the traffic you need to have in the store to justify uh, staying open after cafe hours is a difficult one, right? Do we get to that level in the US one day? I don't know. Um, but I think 
uh, just like in sailing, you, you trim with the wind, right? If, if it keeps coming, you extend a little bit, it keeps coming, you extend a little bit, you experiment. And the idea of experimenting and failing quickly is a powerful one. Uh, otherwise, uh, you might not respond to the market, right? Uh, there's certainly a big opportunity. Uh, these are these are shops, cafes that have uh, existing investments in place. Uh, they have existing systems, existing teams, uh, and some of the concepts could probably support a later day part, but it needs to come with experimenting. Perfect. Um, I think I have one final question here, as I know that we need uh, to to wrap up in the next three minutes. What it, what is uh, being asked here is. How would you balance uh, the amount of stores versus quality? As we we're talking about specialty coffee, and it's all about the experience that you provide to the consumer. And I think that speaks a lot uh, to, to our audience. I'll ask Will yeah. and then Burak if you can go. Sure. Um, and and. I guess my answer is going to be uh, given with the background of I, I was a part of 13 different offerings in the public markets. And then um, so that'll, that'll color some of the um, I don't want to say blow ups, disappointments that, that I've seen. Um, and then and then with a, with a handful on the private side as well. The the way that 99 percent of businesses get in have, have gotten into trouble, as I have seen, um, is, is on the human side. Um, so it's always going to be about quality in, in my mind. There were a lot of companies in, in sort of the um, the blow and go days of the restaurant IPOs, and that was back like so between 2010 and 2014 or so um, that were going to come public at 20% unit growth per year, 30% unit growth per year. And guess how many of them did that for more than two years? None of them really did. Um, and that's because it's very difficult to find the right person to trust to run that business um, and, and not just trust them, but that have the experience to run the business. So, so I think it's always about the general manager of that business first, and and um, th are they incentivized properly? Meaning, do they have real ownership in the business? So I think that's by far and away the most important thing. You can only grow as fast as, as your people will allow, and developing those people internally, I think, is the most important thing that an owner can do. I fully agree. You could not have said it better, Will. Um, it, it's it's uh, it's one way a business can really it's one way you can really mess up things by by trying to step too too much on the the gas pedal. And I'll, I'll say one thing uh, also for for owners of businesses because uh, the problem is when you when you take an investment at a high valuation with investors that 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 expect a lot, you you commit to a growth plan, right? But but the way I view it is. An unfunded growth plan is a form of liability. Right? It's the worst form of liability. It pushes you to, to, to do things beyond your own pace, and that can cause a lot of problems. But uh, And that's why if you take the wrong partners or you underwrite to the wrong growth plan, uh, it can cause a lot of problems. It's probably the, the, the main reason why uh, otherwise successful businesses fail. That's that's a great closing, which comes to my very final question to both of you, because as you said, it's all about people, not only who works in the business, who invest in your business, who help you to grow. So I have a question here that says, how should we get in touch with people like Will or Borak if we want an investment in our retail business? And I'll let you go first, Borak, and then Will. Uh, well, I, my my contact info was on the slide, so feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, we, we again, we 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 get involved with very few uh, companies, but more than happy to to take a look and and uh, try to help. Uh, it's 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 being part of the community, so definitely shoot me a message. Yeah, I would echo those same sentiments. Uh, love to hear hear from you and, and do whatever I can, and and, and if we. Um, have a chance to partner, then that could be phenomenal as well. My my contact information is Will W I L L at Dobbs Brothers D O B B S Brothers dot com. So feel free to shoot me an email as well. So I'd like to thank you both. It has been a pleasure and an honor to have you here today, and um, I really enjoyed the session. And I hope you did the same. Thanks, thank so much. You. thank you so much. Thank you.